Well, welcome to CLCC Online. Today, we pray that this message draws you towards Jesus and strengthens your walk with Him. We as a church believe that we are meant to do life in community. So if you live in the Fraser Valley area, we would love to get you connected into our family. You can find everything you need at our website, clcc.ca. Enjoy. Hello, online family. It is good to be with you wherever you're watching. I'm Pastor Phil, campus pastor in Alder Grove, but excited to be teaching our online family and to be with you guys as well. Let's get into it, shall we? We're in our series, Fresh Start, and we're learning from the book of Ruth. Now, this book, uh, big picture, let's talk about its place in the biblical story. It serves to help transition Israel in a significant way. We know from chapter 1 that this account took place in the time of the judges. So, God's people had been redeemed from slavery in Egypt, given an identity in the wilderness, and then an inheritance through the conquest of Joshua. They have the promised land. What are they going to do with it? You know, the nation was roughly ruled by uh, a series of judges for a lot of years. But if we look through the book of Judges, just before we get to the story of Ruth, we see a running theme that pops up many times, and it's highlighted at the very end of the book of Judges. And, uh, and it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Then we turn the page and we get to Ruth. So we find Israel in sort of a, um, a wild west. You know, there's a law, but it's clearly everyone for themselves functionally. And I think that we can relate to that. You know, in some ways, the modern and digital age is creating its own uh, Wild West experience where in many ways we're not really accountable or connected to others. I think we can begin to see the ways that we too can be sucked into a similar place that the Israelites were in, where we all can be lured into the temptation of doing what is right in our own eyes. I'm reminded of the time when God warned Moses and his people about this very thing in Deuteronomy. And the idea is this, that God was worried that once they got into the promised land and got everything that, they, uh, that God said they'd give them, that they would turn away from God. And this is what we see heading into Ruth. Lawlessness ensues and, and we find ourselves in, in all sorts of trouble. These are times where we need a fresh start, like Israel needed a fresh start. Now, Israel needed strong leadership to guide them back into wholeness with God. Can you think of a time where you needed someone to lean on who was stronger than you? You know, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, physical strength here. Perhaps it was the example of a parent or, or mentor or coach that helped guide you in a really pivotal moment. Maybe it was a small group that helped pick you up when you were in a financial bind I hope at the very least you all have that person that you can call when you have a terrible day at home or at work. You know, that person that really helps stabilize you when no one else can. You know, the story of Ruth transitions the people of Israel, God's people, out of the lawlessness of the judges into the order of the monarchy and the kings. They get a fresh start. And through Ruth, we see God do this through his, I'm going to try to get this right, his chesed, his loving kindness. We're beginning to see that fresh starts don't come from ideal circumstances. And we'll learn uh, how Ruth becomes a catalyst for Naomi's restoration. And as we zoom out, how Ruth becomes a part of God's redemptive work for Israel through David And then as we zoom out even more about how Ruth becomes a part of humanity's restoration through Jesus. And we see that in Matthew chapter 1. Ruth and Naomi get this fresh start. Israel gets this fresh start. And we all have access to a fresh start. It's this beautiful story of God's loving kindness towards us. That kindness moves us from our lawlessness and loneliness into the order and community of his kingdom. Here's something we're going to know as we get into chapter 2. 
Rarely do we see in our lives that we get from lawlessness to order, trauma to healing, failure to success without a little initiative. Now let's get into the story, chapter two, and then let's frame what we mean by this. So follow along with me. Chapter two, verse one. Uh, So Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, Boaz means strength, and that's meant to be a clue for us in terms of our expectations of him in the story. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, you know, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. And so she went out and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Uh, This was like a Jewish law. It kind of made conditions to provide for the poor. We learn about that Leviticus chapter 23. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to, you guessed it, Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. This is the birthplace of David. And it's also the birthplace of Jesus, all of these clues pointing us towards something. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Ah, I see. Now Ruth has Boaz's attention. Early on, we learn that Ruth had a plan. She and Naomi were in a tough situation. But Ruth had this idea, had this plan. I heard the actor Denzel Washington say this in an interview once, that dreams without goals are just dreams, and ultimately they fuel disappointment. And this can be us sometimes. And if we're trying to learn from the example of Ruth, if we're trying to learn from her her actions, how can we learn to exercise loving kindness towards others? There's another phrase that I really like, and it is a a mistake or a warning for us to avoid. The road to hell was paved with good intentions. When it comes to the life of faith, we need more than good intentions. We need more than just dreams or thoughts or ideas. But this happens to us often. You know, we find out that someone is going through a really rough time. And because we can't find a plan that solves everything for them, how many times do we often end up not doing anything? you may not be able to solve someone's problems. In fact, I'd wager to guess that uh, most problems are way too big for any one person to solve. We can be overwhelmed as we you know, zoom out and we look at the enormity of issues and hurts and trauma that's going on in our homes and our countries and our church and our families. But hear me, hear me. Everything that you bring to the table becomes part of the solution. Another way to communicate this idea is this. Four B-grade ideas that actually get done are better than one A-plus idea that doesn't. When it comes to kindness, little things help. You know, Ruth had very little resources. She's gleaning with the poor. This was a bit of a gambit for them. But for Naomi's sake, she couldn't afford to sit around and wait for the perfect resolution to fall into her lap. In fact, the story tells us that she was working almost nonstop. You know, she had an opening and she took it. What are some opportunities that we have to actually demonstrate loving kindness? I'd suggest we don't need as much to start as we think we might. You know, you may not have the words to console someone out of depression. You may not have the experience or the knowledge but you're encouraging text messages or or phone calls saying, hey, you know, man, I love you. I'm praying for you. I I really hope God ministers to you in a meaningful way. That becomes part of the solution in that person's life. Another way to look at this is that we may not be able to solve someone's financial problems, but maybe we can open our home for a meal every once in a while. Little things help. And here's another element of this idea of taking initiative and and acting on our ideas. For the purposes of our story, Ruth had a plan. She knew what she was trying to do. She knew the outcomes and she showed the initiative to work it out. But here's the really cool thing when it comes to the life of faith. There are lots of times when God multiplies what we bring beyond what we expected. 
You never know when a small act, a small gift, a small word can be the thing that turns the tide in someone's life. Sometimes all we feel like we have are those classic bread and and fish situations. We just have a little bit of fish, a little bit of bread, a little bit of resources, and it doesn't look like it's going to move the needle in a meaningful way. But through Jesus, that plan acted out on can turn into something meaningful and supernatural to the people around us. And this can be a good principle, actually, for the uh, supernatural faith community. When we act with the little that we have, we invite God to reveal his strength to us. This is what Ruth shows us. This is what Jesus shows us. And this should encourage us to greater initiative to exercise loving kindness. How can we encourage one another to move past thinking on something or, 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 or wishing that we could solve everything but, but doing nothing and into acting on those ideas? So Ruth had a plan and she acted on it. Let's jump back into the story. How does Boaz react to the initiative of Ruth? In verse 8, Boaz says to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you have left your father and mother, how you've left your homeland, and came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. It's very clear that Boaz was impressed by Ruth's kindness towards Naomi and her determination to act on her plan. If you're rocking with a Bible as you're watching, maybe you're tracking on version regularly, you should really highlight verses 10 through 12. We're going to unpack that for just a sec. You see, Ruth identifies herself as a foreigner, ultimately undeserving of the grace of another people group. But Boaz is moved by her kindness, moved by her heart to restore Naomi, and blesses her with protection and provision. In fact, he invites her to eat with him and take all the extra food that she can carry. And this sounds like a great story to us, and it is. It's beautiful. I want you to get in the headspace of an ancient reader. And for a moment, think of the subtext going on here. We're watching the story of how God is moving Israel from lawlessness to order, from broken to whole. And Israel gets to read that a foreigner is behaving with the loving kindness that is supposed to be the characteristic of their people. Ouch. Ouch. I'm reminded of, and you know, maybe it's not the season for this. But you remember those classic Christmas movies where the father is always busy working and not paying attention to his family and some neighbor or elf or or some kind of character steps in to do the thing that the father was supposed to be doing all along. Israel, big picture here, Israel was too busy doing what was right in their own eyes, chasing their own desires, while Ruth was sacrificing her future for the sake of Naomi. In this, Ruth shows us that self-sacrifice opens the doors of opportunity. Self-sacrifice opens the doors of opportunity. And here we can look at this text in a couple of ways. The first way that we can look at at it is this. The intimacy with God means a death to self. Now, this can be a tough pill to swallow. When a lot of our mediums, you know, we look around And a lot of people are promoting an elevation of self. But in a biblical context, that always ends up in disaster. The whole idea of, you know, do what feels good, do what gives you security, you know, do what everyone else is doing. And you can call it what you want here. 
all these kind of fit into the narrative. You know, consumerism, individualism, workaholism, elitism, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of these idolatries, these are ideas and habits that draw us away from worship of God and real community. If we want to grow in our loving kindness, God actually asks us to die to self. The next thing that this text brings up to us is a reminder that because of sin, we are on the outside looking in. We are foreigners who must likewise humble ourselves at the mercy of God. And this is the initiative taking place. We need a fresh start. When we act as Ruth did, when we put ourselves at the mercy of God, we discover his strength. We discover his loving kindness. We discover what Boaz describes as the full reward. We discover that Jesus is how God exercises his loving kindness towards us, bringing us back through the Spirit to receive the full reward of faith. God so loved the world that he gave, he sacrificed himself for us. Praise God. Ruth executed her plan, and her self-sacrifice got her even more than she bargained for. Let's count, keep track here. Boaz not only lets her continue to glean, but gives her unfettered access to gather whatever she could and supplies her with grain from the bundles meant for his people. Now let's finish digging into the text where we hear from our bitter friend, Naomi. Verse 17 uh, continues this way. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah, which is, you know, Old Testament for about a bundle. Okay, Old Testament for about a bundle. And she took it up and went to the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought with her what food she had left over after being satisfied. So her mother-in-law asked her, you know, where did you glean today? You know, where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. What's Naomi's response? The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He, now we're talking about God, has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. We discover here that a life of loving kindness is one of God's most powerful instruments of change. That life of loving kindness is one of God's most powerful instruments of change. Let's take a look at Naomi. This is someone who has nothing, who has renamed herself Mara. She is bitter, but now she turns from bitter into joyful. The kindness of Ruth and the kindness of Boaz takes her out of that emptiness and anger and bitterness and resentfulness and reminds her of the kindness of God. Our self-sacrifice may be that conduit, that connecting point by which someone else discovers the redeeming strength of God. Your thoughtfulness and actions may be the thing that convinces someone that they haven't been forsaken. It may be the thing that convinces someone that they are loved. And there are hurting people, hurting families who who need the strength of the Lord to heal and lift them up. We found out that Ruth took the initiative. She put herself at, at the mercy of Boaz and she discovered his strength and his kindness. In what ways can we begin to show the same kind of loving kindness? to connect our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools to the guidance and love of our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Lord, let us be attentive to your spirit and to not neglect the work of exercising your loving kindness. We know and we recognize that we can't solve the world's problems. We don't have the power to change even the human heart. But God, we can resolve to play our part Teach us to live in kindness and to put ourselves at your mercy where we can experience your redeeming strength and discover your protection and your provision over our lives. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. If you are looking to get connected, we are one church in multiple locations. Our Alder Grove campus meets at Alder Grove Community Secondary School at 1030, and our Abbotsford campus has three services 
at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 on Sundays. We would love to see you at one of our in-person gatherings. And if you would like to financially support us at CLCC, you can always give at clcc.ca slash give. Have a great week.